we were looking at such essay why right uh, in his book what is literature it is the second chapter we were on uh, page 34 of this edition uh, the rautlet indian edition so on the bottom uh, page uh, 34 uh, such says that the book is not like any other tool uh, a means for any end whatever the end to which it offers itself is the readers freedom now we know that whenever sart speaks of uh, freedom he uh, actually refers to the existentialist concept of freedom and uh, the entire purpose of writing and reading uh, because this chapter is why write uh, the entire purpose of writing and reading sarth explains is to ensure freedom for everyone so sarth makes a political quest into a philosophical quest and uh, through his uh, philosophy of existentialism uh, this philosophy as uh, you already know that uh, the uh, basis of this philosophy being in uh, martin heidegger uh, martin heidegger's concept of dasein that is uh, the ontological being of a of an individual that is dasein so we all have to deal with our existence our being to this uh, ontological philosophical idea of being of existence sart gives this twist to his existentialist philosophy that uh, the gap between uh, being in itself when i want to be being in itself i mostly end up being being for itself the gap between my being and other so when i put myself in a subject position i put the other in an object position and this gap is my freedom where i can choose which attitude i should take towards the other the whole i can exercise this freedom and i can be ontologically free only when nobody is a slave uh, according to sarth's existential philosophy uh, because i want to be the entire world i want to be being in itself i want to be the absolute being i want to comprehend everything in myself i want to be the sole subject of the universe that is why if anybody remains a slave and is not free then i also cannot be totally free all right so uh, the book uh, is not the means for any end the end to which it offers itself is the reader's freedom so this word end it uh, refers to the philosophical idea of teleology telos means end so what is the end or objective of anything that is its teleology so uh, sartre says that there is no such uh, limited end uh, for a book its objective its end if there is any that end is the pervasive idea of freedom ensuring total freedom a book does not have any other limited objective or goal and the kantian expression finality without end seems to me quite inappropriate for designating the work of art so immanuel uh, kant the german philosopher uh, he in his book of uh, critic of judgment in his book 
critic of German, uh, referred to uh, aesthetics, referred to uh, the philosophical uh, meaning of art, uh, where he suggested that art has a finality without end. Actually, uh, this is what Sartre uh, or how Sartre translates uh, the phrase, the German phrase. Uh, the German phrase is Sweknesiskeit ohne Sweck, that is purposiveness without purpose. Sartre translates it as finalite sans fin or finality without end. I am writing the chat book. This uh, German phrase actually means purposiveness. Sartre in his French writes finality, finality without end. Uh, <coughs> so Sartre disagrees with Kant that art has a finality without end. Now, uh, on this matter, I sent you a few notes through WhatsApp. You will look at them. Uh, when Kant discusses a work of art, he compares it with nature. For example, there is a flower that blooms, which is uh, beautiful, which appears to us as beautiful. But what is the purpose of that flower? There is no purpose of that flower, uh, apparently. But uh, as if it has a purpose. So Kant says that it has a purposiveness. Uh, it appears to be uh, having a purpose, even though that purpose is inscrutable we cannot understand the scheme of things. So Kant suggests that people do not understand the scheme of things of this world. Being a philosopher, of course, he cannot speak of God. So he says that we cannot understand the scheme of things, but yet it appears that there is some kind of a scheme, that there is some purposiveness. Swet Meshishkite in the order of this world. Uh, and Sartre disagrees with Kant, uh, suggesting that a work of art cannot be compared to nature. A work of art is shaped by human consciousness. Its order is shaped by human consciousness. And it is not at all similar to a flower that blooms or a beautiful lake or a mountain. It has no similarity. Uh, okay. So Kant here, uh, Sartre here disagrees with this expression. He says it is inappropriate for designating a work of art. In fact, it implies that the aesthetic object presents only the appearance of a finality and is limited to soliciting the free and ordered play of the imagination. It forgets that the imagination of the spectator has not only a regulating function, but a constitutive one. It does not play, it is called upon to recompose the beautiful object beyond the places left by the artist. Whose imagination Sartre is talking about here? Very strangely, he is not talking about the imagination of the artist. He is talking about the imagination of the reader or the, you know, or, or the or one who looks at a painting, for example, the consumer of art. So that person has an imagination and he therefore creates a reading of the work of art. Therefore, Sartre says that uh, the imagination of the spectator as a regulating function. Uh, uh, it does not have only a regulating function, but a constitutive one. That is, what is the meaning of a work is constituted by the imagination of the spectator or the reader. 
this is something that Kant never took into account. Because like other 19th century thinkers, the equation between God and artist as creator, that must have been playing in Kant's mind. Because he was thinking only about the imagination of the artist, not about the spectator. But uh, after the world wars, uh, the, the role of the reader, the role of the spectator becomes very significant for even for philosophers or thinkers. The imagination cannot reveal in itself any more than can other functions of the mind. It is always on the outside, always engaged in an enterprise. There would be finality without end if some object offered such a well-arranged composition that it would lead us to suppose that it has an end even though we cannot ascribe one to it. So this is uh, how Kant imagines it, but Sartre says that uh, it is a wrong definition, not suitable for work of art. By defining the beautiful in this way one can, and this is Kant's end, liken the beauty of art to natural beauty. Since a flower, for example, presents so much symmetry, such harmonious colors, and such regular curves, that one is immediately tempted to seek a finalist explanation for all these properties, and uh, to see them as just so many means at the disposal of an unknown end. So this attitude of hunting for an end, looking for an end, what is the end of all this? So here we see beautiful mountain ranges, clouds in the sky, natural beauty and we ponder what is the end behind this? So this is a theological kind of imagination. And so we tend to imagine that there must be a creator, there must be God behind all this. Uh, similarly, when you look at a work of art and we think, what is the purpose of the artist? What did he want to do? You know, so that is the old school of thinking, the old way of thinking. And after Sartre, uh, further this uh, school has been demolished by writers like Rolabert and Michel Foucault. Uh, roll about through the right through the essay uh, death of the author and Foucault uh, through uh, what is an author the essay so these uh, 21st century or 20th century uh, philosophers they are not thinking in theological in a theological manner not always thinking of the creator. They are thinking of how the, the world is perceived in one. So why could Sartre change his thinking, change the manner of his thinking? Why was the manner of his thinking different from that of Kant? Because of the influence of Husserl and Heidegger. Because Husserl, through his phenomenology, suggested that uh, there is no point in talking about reality or about matter or about consciousness. Only one must take into account how the world is perceived in our consciousness as phenomena. You see, therefore, the, uh, the uh, determining arrow or the compass swerved from the author, the creator, to the uh, to the consumer, to the to the uh, one who is the spectator, to one one who uh, is confronted with this thing, whether it is the world or whether it is work of art. The beauty of nature is in no way comparable to that of art. The work of art does not have an end. There we agree with Kant. But the reason is that it is an end. That is what Kant doesn't say. Sartre says that yes, Kant also believes that this world is without, uh, that art is without purpose. 
But Sartre says that it is without purpose because it is an end itself. The Kantian formula does not account for the appeal which resounds at the basis of each painting, each statue, each book. Kant believes that the work of art first exists as fact and that it is then seen, whereas it exists only if one looks at it and if it is first pure appeal, pure ex existence to exist. So this is actually the crux of the whole debate. Does the world exist irrespective of us or does the world appear only when human con consciousness can perceive it? So taking a cue from Husserl's terminology, Sartre applies this idea to a work of art, just as Husserl applied this idea to the world. Uh, Sartre says, a work of art does not exist from beforehand. It is, it is not like uh, some creator created a work of art and without the spectator it can exist. It, it cannot. Sartre says that it comes into existence only when one sees it, only when there is a spectator. And uh, so uh, the work of art throws an appeal uh, which uh, would make it possible to exist. It throws an appeal to the spectator. If the spectator does not see it, then it cannot exist. You remember that here Sastri is also punning through the uh, French word appel, uh, which uh, means both an appeal as well as call. So we work about calls the spectator. This absolute end, this imperative which is transcendent yet acquiesced in, which freedom itself adopts as its own, is what we call a value. The work of art is a value because it is an appeal. So Sartre says that the work of art is an end. Art itself is an absolute end. And it has an imperative. What is the imperative? The imperative to exist. It can exist uh, only when a spectator looks at it. Therefore, there is uh, this uh, transcendent uh, existence, the appeal for transcendence. So what does the work transcend? The work transcends its pre-existing pre -existing state and comes into existence through the intervention of the consciousness of the spirit. That is why it is transcendent. And uh, acquiesced in, who acquiesces? The spectator acquiesces to look at the work of art and because of that it can come into existence. And this imperative, Sartre says, this uh, end of art, it is a freedom which uh, it is uh, something that freedom itself ad adopts as its own and we call it a value. Um, it seems to be complicated, but it is not. What Sartre means is that you remember that there is a book in my bookshelf. Whether I pick up the book and read it or not, that there lies my freedom. There is a work of art. Whether I will go and look at it or not, there lies my freedom. Freedom adopts the end of art. That is, 
the absolute end of art is adopted by freedom. So I exercise my freedom, I look at the work of art, the work of art comes into existence and that is also its value. What is the value? That I exercise my freedom to look at the work of art. This uh, the end of art is something that freedom includes or adopts and thereby creates a value. So that tries to give an, uh, uh, a philosophical explanation of the value of art. So Sartre has to, uh, you know, work on a very thin edge. He does not want to be uh, an aestheticist. He does not want to be in the position of art for art's sake. At the same time, he does not want to be a didactic that art has value because it teaches a moral. So he works on a thin edge. He says that art is valuable because it is an exercise in freedom by the spectator. That is why it is a, you know, that is why this uh, absolute end of art is a value. Is it clear? Yes, yes sir. <laughs> the work of art is a value because it is an appeal. So, the way such links every sentence by cause and effect, that has a mesmerizing kind of a busy effect. Why cause and effect? Uh, so, why uh, art is a value? Because freedom adopts it. Why? Uh, it is a value because it is an appeal. Basically, he is saying the same thing by using different expressions. So, we see here that appeal becomes important to him. And when he uses the word appeal, we always must remember the other meaning of the word appeal or appelle to call. So, though anybody who learns French, the first thing he or she learns is How do you call yourself? So, Sartre thinks about this call, that is, a work of art gives out a call for the spectator to pick it up, like a radio wave, let us imagine. Just as this world calls us in so many ways, philosophically speaking, that we cannot neglect it, we react to it and we, by reacting to it, we exercise our freedom. Right. So that is why the idea of appeal is important, why? Because uh, this appeal or this call, it leads to the question of heeding to the call. Is if you heed to the call, as you respond to the call, you exercise your freedom. So here, man gets his agency from this philosophical idea that a work of art is an appeal. Therefore, man becomes active and responds to it. So this mode of response for Sartre, it is just parallel to our mode of response to the world. So how do we respond to the events of the world? On every issue we respond and we 
take a stand. So you see how the philosophical question of appeal and response that leads to the political idea of responding to all events wherever there are issues where freedom is caused or somebody is being violated, somebody is being enslaved. These events send us a signal, send us an appeal and we must respond to it. If we respond to these events, then we are active as human beings, then we are free human beings. So that is why Sartre you know, uh, engaged in political activism uh, during the students movement in the 1960s. Because philosophically he linked human freedom to response to any oppression or any farming of freedom. Uh, if I appeal to my readers so that we may carry the enterprise which I have begun to a successful conclusion, uh, it is self-evident that I consider him as a pure freedom, as an unconditioned activity. Thus in no case can I address myself to his passiveness, that is try to affect him, to communicate to him from the very first emotions of fear, desire or anger. Sartre says that readers should not be affected by emotions uh, provided or provoked by the writer. They must have absolute freedom. So Sartre says that if my project is to write a book, the project can be completed if and only if readers respond to it without being afraid or without having other kinds of emotions, hatred, love, any kind of emotions. Because emotions tend to uh, cloud one's free judgment, tend to cloud the Therefore, uh, readers should not be affected by emotions. There are doubtless authors who concern themselves solely with arousing these emotions because they are foreseeable, manageable and because they have at their disposal sure fire means of provoking them. So readers who want to, uh, sorry, authors who want to earn cheap popularity they manipulate the emotions of readers. It is a surefire way of provoking the reader. But that should not be done. But it is also true that they are reproduced, that they are reproached for this kind of thing. As Euripides has been since antiquity because he had children appear on the stage. I'm giving an example from antiquity. So if children appear on the stage, people become unduly, uh, you know, emotionally perturbed and Euripides made children appear and therefore he was criticized. So, uh, people should not be unnecessarily provoked uh, emotionally. Freedom is alienated in the state of passion. It is abruptly engaged in partial enterprises, it loses sight of its task, which is to produce an absolute so if there is emotion, then freedom is alienated. By being emotionally guided, a spectator or reader loses his way. Uh, he has a short-sighted vision, thinks of some immediate you know, fulfillment. But the purpose is to reach the absolute art. So, as such thinks of art being an absolute end, that is art is without any 
further end, which means art is not a tool, not an instrument for achieving some end. Art is an end in itself, yet he is not uh, telling us about the art for art's sake, theory, aesthetics, theory. So art is an absolute end uh, because it uh, makes us exercise our freedom. Uh, that freedom is clouded by emotions. And the book is no longer anything but a means for creating hate or desire. The writer should not seek to uh, overwhelm, which means that Sartre suggests that no writer should try to provoke the crude emotions of people and write in a way that might lead one to hate somebody, uh, be angry at something. This is not the way that a writer should write because these emotions will uh, make the reader stray from the path of reaching the absolute end of art. So feeding hate or desire should not be done. The writer should not overwhelm. The reader must be able to make a certain aesthetic, aesthetic withdrawal. Aesthetic withdrawal, that is, a reader should not be too emotionally involved with the work. The reader must retain his distance. Therefore, uh, mentally, the reader should be able to withdraw from aesthesis, that is perception of the art, work of art. This is what uh, Gauthier foolishly confused with art for art's sake. So, Sartre criticizes the French poet Gauthier, uh, who spoke about the art for art's sake theory. So, uh, Sartre says, or suggests, that the true meaning of art for art's sake is that a reader should or a spectator should be able to temporarily withdraw from the work of art and have some, you know, have more freedom. It is simply a matter of precaution and Rene more justly calls it the author's politeness towards the reader. Sartre uses uh, quotes from Jean Rene. Uh, artist. So, uh, Sat says that Jene calls it the politeness of the author towards the reader. That is, the author should not overwhelm the reader, should give him some space and should not provoke him into too much emotion. However, these feelings are of a particular kind. One, one certainly creates the aesthetic object with feelings. If it is touching, uh, it appears to our tears. If it is comic, it will be recognized by laughter. But these feelings are of a particular kind. They have their origin in freedom. They are loaned. They are loaned. The belief which I accord the tale is freely assented to. It is a passion in the Christian sense of the word. Uh, that is, a freedom which resolutely puts itself into a state of passiveness to obtain a certain transcendent effect by this sacrifice. Such is the Christian metaphor of uh, the passion, uh, the passion of Christ, as Christ sacrificed himself voluntarily by becoming passive. Similarly, the, uh, when the reader uh, leads to some emotions, comic or tragic in the world. These are voluntary yielding. These are not cases where the reader is overwhelmed. So these are voluntary yielding, uh, deliberate uh, engaging uh, in some kind of passion. So passion here means not being active, being passive. The reader renders himself uh, credulous. He descends into credulity, which though it ends by enclosing him like a dream, is at every moment conscious of being free. An effort is sometimes made to force the uh, writer into this dilemma. 
either one believes in your story and it is intolerable or one does not believe in it and it is ridiculous so the writer also has to strike a balance he cannot make readers believe his story is too much because then the readers will lose their freedom at the same time uh, he cannot make his story absolutely unbelievable because then it will be ridiculous so such give the example of uh, these characters uh, from russian author Raskolnikov as i said would only be a shadow without the mixture of repulsion and friendship which i feel for him and which makes him live so the characters are created or they they become valuable only when the reader's passion enters into them therefore there must be some amount of passion but that passion must not be overwhelming but by reversal which is the characteristic of the imaginary object it is not his behavior which excites my indignation or esteem but my indignation and esteem which is the consistency and objectivity to his behavior which means that the character in a novel the character provokes certain emotions in the reader and it is these emotions which make the character appear to the reader thus the reader's feelings are never dominated by the object and as no external reality can condition them they have their permanent source in freedom that is they are all generous for i call it feeling generous which had its origin and its end in freedom the such uses this uh, interesting idea that a reader lends his credulity lends his emotions to a work of art to a novel for example so he is generous because he allows his emotions to be in play he looks at the character sympathetically as if he identifies with it with it or he uh, puts his emotions into the character and makes it clear that is why he is generous so the feelings of the reader are not dominated by the object so basically reading is also an act of confrontation between subject and object just as our everyday being is an act of confrontation between us and the world between subject and object similarly reading or looking at a work of art aesthetic apprehension is a confrontation between me as subject and the work of art as an object and the object can never dominate my feelings no external reality can condition them for is such saying here such says that as subjects we are not overwhelmed by the world or by the work of art because if we are overwhelmed if the external reality is so powerful that it overwhelms me then i am dominated by it i become an object but external reality is not that powerful not so powerful over the human consciousness so notice how in existential reason consciousness is very important and even though existentialist philosophy is a materialist philosophy particularly sartre was very much close to marxism yet consciousness becomes very important for sartre matter cannot overwhelm the mind 
because then mind loses itself. It becomes an object dominated by matter. Where does Sati get this idea? Must be from Husserl and Heidegger. Uh, thus, reading is an exercise in generosity, and what the writer requires of the reader is not the application of an abstract freedom, but the gift of a whole person with his passions, his prepositions, his sympathies, his sexual temperament, and his scale of values. So, all these are called upon by a book, by a novel. Okay. Therefore, a reader invests a lot when reading a novel, when, be, when uh, consuming a work of art. He invests his passions, his uh, belief, his values, even his sexual temperament, all these things. Therefore, he is generous. Only this person will give himself generously. Freedom goes through and through him and comes to transform the darkest masses of his sensibility. Now, Sastri is no uh, psychoanalytic thinker, no, uh, nobody like Freud, but he speaks of darkest areas in our consciousness, which are affected by your work of art as one consumes a work of art, reads a novel, for example. It transforms the darkest masses of his sensibility. And as activity has rendered itself passive in order for it better to create the object, vice versa, passiveness becomes an act. It is the passiveness of the reader which helps in creating the book as a work of art. Therefore, passivity may be looked upon as an act here. The man who is reading has raised himself to the highest degree. That is why we see people who are known for their toughness shed tears at the recital of imaginary misfortunes. For the moment they have become what they would have been if they had not spent their lives hiding their freedom from themselves. Why does a book affect somebody? Even a tough person sheds tears when some imaginary suffering is depicted. Because that tough person, the tough exterior, hides the freedom of the person to react to sufferings of others. But the person had been hiding his uh, reaction, his reaction to his sufferings because he wanted to appear as a tough person. But when he looks at an artistic representation of it, a novel or a drama or a tragedy, then that illusion is gone because it is a work of art, it is not reality, so the tough person sheds his illusion and he is seen to be. We have seen that in Renaissance drama there has been the device of the play within the play. To catch the consciousness or to catch the actual state of mind of some person who had been concealing his emotions. We see that in uh, the Spanish tragedy in Hamlet. By enacting something artistically, theatrically, by representing something, the consciousness of the perpetrator, of the criminal, is caught. The author writes in order to address himself to the freedom of readers and he requires it in order to make his work exist. But he does not stop there, he also requires that they return this confidence which he has given them, that they recognize his creative freedom 
and that they in turn solicit it by a symmetrical and inverse appeal. The interdependence of the author and the reader. The author's work has allowed the reader to know himself and the reader gets confidence by reading a work as he knows more about himself. So the reader should also recognize the creative freedom of the author. So what I suggest here that it is reciprocal. The author must give the reader freedom to react to his work and the reader must give the author a creative freedom, freedom to create. Here there appears the other dialectical paradox of reading. The more we experience our freedom, the more we recognize that of the other. The more he demands of us, the more we demand of him. So, two work of art. One is able to realize one's freedom because one freely acts or reacts to the work. But the more one knows about oneself through such reactions, the more one recognizes that the other should also be given freedom. So the reader realizes that the author should be given freedom. Or if uh, the work presents a dismal scenario of our world in the book, if it talks about operation of people, represents them graphically, then the reader realizes that all these people also need freedom. This is how, uh, since the reading is essentially an exercise in freedom, therefore a book, whether from the side of the author or from the side of the reader, a book will always draw one towards understanding towards an understanding of freedom or its lack.